Hey, you're listening to a Bible Bro Down podcast, a member of the Trinity Commission. This is where brothers come together to sharpen one another so we can rightly divide the Word of God. I'm Matt. And this is Billy. And we're back today uh, with another kind of just, that's not a discussion episode, I guess. I mean, a little bit, but we're going to do what we, we offer to do. And this, is, this episode is going to be, I guess, kind of an example of it. We're going to take a couple articles discussing the personhood of the Trinity. One of them is offering several points and verses, several 12 points and verses on why the Holy Spirit is not a, considered a person of the Trinity, which I guess would make them binary. They think the Father and the Son is, are both persons, but the Spirit is not. And then another uh, article does argue for the personhood of the Trinity through several verses. And we're just going to, you know, go through them, take them, take their arguments and their passages uh, one at a time, see what we think about them and uh, see how it shakes out. Right. And someone who doesn't necessarily believe that the Holy Spirit is a person, which would mean that the Holy Spirit isn't God, um, could believe that Jesus is a person in God or not. So there's there would be two two categories with this. You know, there's Unitarians. But the specific article that we're going to be looking at, they're as we, we were trying to figure out what what, what would that be. They they believe God is binary, a binarian, <laughs> Bi- binatarian. No, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going with binary versus Trinity. Right. But uh, I, so let's before we get into all that, let's talk about anathematizing and and you know throwing stones, things like that. If someone, because we had, we just had this discussion, but for the sake of the audience, if someone. Uh, says, yes, I believe in God of the Bible. I believe the Father sent the Son. I believe that they're both God, two persons, uh, both the same being. And I believe uh, that, you know, the entire redemption story, God sent his Son to die for us. He paid the atonement. You know, everything, how we would explain it. But they, they get to the point where they say, but I just don't see that the Holy Spirit is personal. Like, He's personal in the same way that wisdom is in Proverbs 8 and 9, where it's just, it's just personified as doing things, even though we don't think that wisdom is a member of the Trinity. So he, he, he acts on behalf of the Father and the Son, but like because it's their spirit, not because he's a personal independent agent. Um, is that, I mean, they're, they're confessing God. They're, they're ascribing a different kind of ontology to him than, than you and I would. But can we say that that person's just not saved because they're disagreeing on this particular point? I I wouldn't say that. I may have in the past, but I wouldn't say that any longer. I think there's definitely, um, especially when you get into the ontological nature of God, you know, that's, first of all, none of us have ever seen him with our own eyes. (laughs) And and he doesn't give this giant discourse of like, all right, this is how I am, right? We're, We're talking about, a, a timeless, spaceless, immaterial being, right? And and I think there's a lot of room for um, confusion <laughs> is a good one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Doubt, um, matters of opinion. I mean, we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit, but I mean, so many times I see in scripture where sometimes it's like the author or the interpreter has, has put in a, a capital S as it, it relates to a person. I could see that doesn't have to be that, instance that could just be talking about like a, a, a metaphorical like oh the spirit of um john the baptist had the spirit of elijah not that he had some ontological spirit of elijah but he had the same kind of like demeanor and nature of elijah you know having this oh you should walk with the spirit of god not like there's this spirit next to me and we're walking hand in hand, but walk with the spirit of God is in like be loving, gentle, kind, patient, long suffering and merciful, forgiving. So. So before we get into these two articles, where do you fall on this? Is the Holy spirit a person in your opinion? Uh, yes. So That's, you would call it, yourself it, a Trinitarian. Yeah. And I mean, biggest part of that would be tradition. I mean, that's how I was raised. Um, what the church has believed. And I'm very much not, uh, as our audience has probably learned from us, we're not big on tradition, but I can honestly say that's why I believe this. I mean, there's many, many things I've grown up to believe um, that unless someone makes a good argument against it and it's rational and I study it, you know, I'm going to take the default position, so to speak. God in time. 
Right. We we defaulted to God knows all future events, not because we had a good reason for it, but because we just always believed it. And right. That was the thing. Um, I am. I believe the Holy Spirit is personal, a person. I believe, you know, I, I, I pray to him. Like, I thank him for interceding for me, things like that. Mm-hmm. We'll get to the Bible verses for it. But I, I, I think he is a person of the Trinity. Um, and if it turns out that the Trinity is not how we tra- traditionally, and when I say traditionally, I mean from the very, from the, church fathers like from the uh, the way the apostles describe it the early church fathers onward the trinity is in three persons one being was not you know uh, uh, that's not a recent development that's been around um but Correct. if that turns out that it's not true and that this more binary way is actually the right way i don't i don't expect god to kick me out of the kingdom because i <laughs> i got that wrong like we got to keep in mind that the standard that we hold for others is the same for us or we, we, you know be careful about that um, and I do want to point out before we get going, if you're concerned about someone getting the ontology of God's being, like Billy said, this, this timeless, this spaceless, immaterial being, not understanding him perfectly and getting that right. And, and if you don't understand him personally, therefore you're kicked out. Of, I mean, understand him perfectly, therefore you're kicked out of the kingdom. If, if you think that that's uh, a problem, then you got to be really careful about how you uh, deal with, uh, let's say you're a traditionalist or a provisionist or a... Arminian, how you deal with a Calvinist or Roman Catholic. Um, a Calvinist does not believe the same things about God that an Arminian does. Um, neither one of them believe the same thing about God that a, a uh, Roman Catholic might. There's, you know, everybody has different beliefs about God. And that's, so we're just, we want to be careful when you hear this and we, when we go through these points, don't, don't think that this person who might believe this way, they could be just immature, not studied. They could be very studied and just landing on a different opinion, but we're not going to kick them out of the kingdom and anathematize them simply because they've come to a different conclusion because we wouldn't want to be kicked out of the kingdom for the places where we're wrong because we're right. certainly wrong on something. Right. So, it becomes like you mentioned there, if it comes out that he's binary or Unitarian, you know, we're, I, I, I'm trusting God's love, grace and kindness. And it's not it, about certain facts. It's about trusting. Is, right. Yeah. Allegiance. Mm. Not, not perfect just just allegiance fear the lord maker of heaven and earth give him glory and honor and thanks and nowhere in in any of those gospel declarations it, he's opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble uh it doesn't say he's opposed to the proud and people who you know don't have every detail worked out right it's pride versus humility allegiance so mm-hmm. yeah and there's there's a lot i think there's also a, a struggle in the church that you see with with measuring grace and truth. I think sometimes you get people focused on one or the other where they're all about grace um, and there is no truth or they don't, there's no focus on the truth or they're all about the truth and they treat people, you know, and anath- anathetize them and, you know, kick them out of the kingdom and call them names and have d- entire ministries devoted to doing this. You know, those we're supposed to have grace and truth. Right. And uh, it's interesting. Just this past Sunday, we had a, a, a special guest speaker and he talked about this and he talked about how um, like it's like a rubber band. If you have a rubber band and you just hold it in your thumb. Right. Like you're just doing grace or just doing truth. There is no real power there there. But you need to have both. Right. And you, you stretch a band and you need to have this tension with both of them. And that's that's where there's power when you can when you have truth and you can have grace together. And I think a lot of people fall one side or the other. Yeah. And and then people argue about which one is right. And then there's divisions made mm-hmm. versus there can be differences. And yeah. Uh, so where do you want to start? You want to start with the uh, Dr. Lugan bills. Uh, we'll confess we're, we like, <laughs> we're longtime followers of, uh, of the pro personhood of the Holy spirit article. And then uh, the other one, we don't know who this person is. But <laughs> uh, which one do you want to start with, pro or con? Uh, we, or um, I think because our audience are probably going to be Trinitarians and believe in the person of the Holy Spirit, we yeah. could just do a quick little, you know, summation of of some verses that bring this about. We're going to talk about some of these verses and the reasons why it's not, but just to give us a little foundation of the personhood of the Holy Spirit. And and to be clear, we're going to be looking at these verses that Dr. Luganville offers and with hopefully with the same objectivity that we're going to be looking at the verses that the other article offers, because 
it doesn't do anybody any good if we're just cheerlead for one side and not bother to actually critically examine it and right. see if we can find another way to understand those verses. Right. So we're going to attempt. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't even, I mean, he, uh, this article. So this is Dr. Robert Luganville. He's a Hebrew classic Greek scholar. He, he's got a PhD in classics um, focusing on Hebrew and Greek. I mean, that's why he went into um, uh, what, like he's got like 16 years of education, uh, learning all this stuff just so he could read the Bible and better understand it. And he teaches classics at a university um, and he writes a whole lot. Um, his website, uh, should we give that? It is. Ichthys.com. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I-C-H-T-H-Y-S.com. You know, it's a little fish symbol. Um, and he's been around since I think 1997 or eight. He's had his website and there's tens of thousands of pages. And question and answers. Yeah. A lot of those. Yeah. And if you're, if you hear us read one of these verses and you say, I don't, what translation is that? It most likely is his. He's, he's just translates, does his own translation. So feel mm -hmm. free to, to back up and, and check out NASV or ESV or any other translation you like, but that's why you're hearing the differences. And there'll be, he has some insertions and stuff where um, you may not see that in your own Bible. But. Right. But I mean, I think about just um, the Great Commission, right, Matthew, like baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we have like name of, of these three, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit it seems to speak about the name, like this family of three people. Right. And that's what the believer is supposed to be. in. we are in the family of God. We are in the family of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so kicking it off, again, this is ictus.com. You can scroll down and uh, see his uh, pneumatology study. And we're looking specifically at the section. <laughs> if you go to one of his studies and you click on it and you're like, holy cow, how long is this thing? Yeah, it's that long. Um, but he has links to each of the sections. So just click person of the Holy Spirit and you'll get there. Um, but he says, as God, the Spirit has the same personhood as the Father and the Son, as may be clearly seen from the way in which he and his relationship with the Father and the Son is described in Scripture. And then he launches into the first verse. Uh, and I'll read 2 Corinthians 13, 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So this is the outro to, the, to 2 Corinthians. And this is usually he does like a doxology or something like that. And this is wrapping it up. You know, may the grace of Christ love of the Father, and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So, personhood-wise, not hard to see. Fellowship of the Holy Spirit, how do you fellowship with just a, a power? Fellowship, generally, I think, uh, implies personal agency. I, Billy and I fellowship with one another. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, do you agree with that? And also, is there another way you can see this verse? That Well, this is just like the Great Commission, where you have these three, and it appears to be like by just general reading people, distinct beings kind of thing. Um, I suppose you could say, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the father. Right. So you got like the prince or the king and the, and this, the prince, right. And the fellowship of the Holy spirit. And then again, this could be, if you could want to take and the fellowship of the Holy spirit, right. Which could be like the characteristics of God. Right. So, may the grace of Jesus, the love of the father and the fellowship. You could say like, and the fellowship of love and the fellowship of peace and the fellowship, you know, that kind of, I, I you could guess, take it that way as well. Maybe. Yeah. Let me, I'm pulling up the Greek. Um, Cause I see what you're saying. And, and it's similar to like, uh, if uh, your son does something that you, he knows you'll appreciate and he's doing it in the spirit of his dad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, and you're saying, what if, what if that can be taken that way? Let's see in the Greek. Biblehub.com. Love it. I know some people like Blue Letter Bible. I've never really used it, but uh, that's also another free resource. Use your free resources online. If you can afford Logos, go for it. But we're not trying to afford that. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, the Holy Spirit uh, of the, so the definite article is genitive, it's possessive, of the uh, Hagoi Numitas. So it's, it's of the Holy Spirit with the definite article. Yeah, I, I don't know that it can be taken the way you're saying. Um, I know what you're saying, but the way it's written here seems to be a proper title versus in the spirit of something, you mm -hmm. know? So, 
What's the next one? Uh, for the mystery of the law of lawlessness is already at work. It is only the restrainer uh, who keeps things in check and will until he moves out of the way. I I, I could see many people disagreeing with this because there's mm -hmm. dispute on what the restrainer is. <laughs> Some people think the restrainer is the church. Some people think it's the spirit. Um, yeah. Well, and let, I'm, I'm pulling that up as well. You could say that the restrainer is just God the Father. I mean, it doesn't have mm -hmm. to be. Right. Unless pneumatos or pneuma, you know it, something about spirit is is mentioned in that. I don't know that that's necessarily the best verse for claiming it. Although I do tend to agree, it's the Holy Spirit that is moving in the world and restraining. And right. we've we've always uh, credited the Holy Spirit with the universal witness that if someone rejects God, they are essentially blaspheming the Spirit because that's the one who is there witnessing to everybody. Right. And back in Leviticus, it talks about, you know, blaspheming the Lord. Um, well, Second Corinthians 3, and this is the one that is not in here either, but uh, it says um, Second Corinthians chapter 3, right around verses uh, 12 through 18. This is about Israel and, and them not believing. But mm -hmm. this is, therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened for until this day at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. So here, this is saying, this is putting direct, to me, it seems like direct personhood. This Now now the Lord is the spirit. So whenever a person turns to the Lord, and the Lord is the spirit, right? Mm -hmm. it definitely puts some personhood on here. It also puts, ties this whole blasphemy of the spirit or blasphemy of the Lord back mm -hmm. in Leviticus to this as well, right? When you're blaspheming God, you're blaspheming the spirit. Yeah, and I think that just personally for us is one of the, that's not in, in his study that I see yet, although that verse is, we'll get to it in a second, but uh, just for us and, and the way we've described, we've argued for or defended the Trinity is the Holy Spirit is consistently compared to the Lord or God mm -hmm. and, and credited with the same actions that the Father and the Son do. And yeah, I, I just, that, that's, I think blaspheming the Holy Spirit and the fact that you're blaspheming the Lord or, blas or calling God a liar all tie in although i could see someone arguing well yeah if you're denying his power or blaspheming his power which is that's essentially what they lower the holy spirit to is his power going out uh then you are blaspheming god because it's his power right i could see that argument i don't necessarily agree with it but i will say in second thessalonians 2 7 it is only the restrainer it in in the greek we're looking at uh basically uh, only there is the one restraining it, which is lawlessness, the, the, the one restraining lawlessness. So it doesn't mention of the spirit here. Someone could argue that's just right. God. Yeah. Right. Acts 10, 19 and 20. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go to them for I have sent them to you. So this is Acts 10, right before he gets to Cornelius. He's just had the, the sheet come down with the animals. And the Spirit said to him. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think of anything that um, speaks like with audible words that isn't a person. Well, let me read a quote real quick. Just to. So let's see. Is this the right article? Ah, Jesus once said, uh, this is Luke 11, um, 11, 49. The wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles. Well, again, we don't credit wisdom with being a member of the Trinity. Right. But Jesus is quoting, uh, granted, he's quoting, I think, a, a wisdom literature, which is full of metaphor and personification. And he's quoting that. But uh, wisdom is speaking here, but... I think there's two different situations, right? You have wisdom literature and all of the, the the figurative language that's in that versus acts, which is historical, 
mm-hmm. and it seems to be a person that actually saying to Peter, like physically speaking to him. Correct. So I don't know any other way you can see that. Um, I can't think of any other way. Yeah. So I think if that's, we'll put that in the category of, eh, seems to be pretty good support of personhood of the mm-hmm. spirit. Right. Um, she read this one just a minute ago. I don't know if you want to read right. his version, which has got a bunch of <laughs> parentheses and stuff in it. Or? No, it's fine. Um, Romans eight twenty six, and the spirit helps in our weakness in a similar way for we do not know what we ought to pray, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with anguished supplications with which words cannot express. Mm-hmm. Does that have in it in the Greek the himself? While you're looking that up. Are you looking it up? Yep. Okay, I'm gonna. So, what I see here, and it's, it's funny, the other article uses this verse in it, to show that the spirit is not personal, which boggles my mind a little bit. Yeah. But <laughs> what I see here is okay. If if the spirit is just the power of God, and uh, for we do not know what we ought to pray, but the power of God intercedes for us also with anguish supplications. He's interceding for us between us and God. But if it's just the power of the Father, and then he's interceding between us and himself. Like he's doing it himself between us. Like it, it, it almost it requires another person. Yes, right. same one in being, but it requires another person to intercede on behalf of two parties. Right. I just don't see how I mean that this is one of the stronger ones for me, I think, that that it requires a personal agent to intercede on behalf of, or in between two other parties that this is just the power of God doing the interceding doesn't make sense to me at all. Right. Especially when you look at the the context, like the historical um, context of the intercessor, the mediator in the old Testament was always mm-hmm. a person. Yeah, absolutely. Moses is an example right. that is used in Romans six, the very next chapter. Right. So, it will, and also keep in mind in Romans 8, you have prior to this, the the spirit in us testifying about the son and the father, because he's saying uh, that he's testifying to us that we'll be raised like the son and that mm-hmm. we are children of the father. Right. Now I get, you know, the father could be telling us we're his children, which in a way he is, but the fact that he's using this other agent to do it seems to imply personhood to him. Right. So I think all of Romans 8 is good. Yeah, it's autos. It actually does have himself in there. Himself, autos, herself, yeah. them. Yeah, autos. Um, yeah. Um, so that's good for now. And we've we've talked about the Trinity before. Uh, Matt mentioned earlier um, some of the things that we've talked about um, in, in the roles of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, um, how they're all interlinked with one another. Um, you know, the, you can, there's passages that talk about believing in God, the father to be self for say salvation, believe in the son for salvation, believe in, in the spirit for salvation. There's passages relating to the creator, God, the father created the son created the spirit created who raised Jesus from the dead. All three are given, uh, that, that description who will raise us from the dead. All are given that description. Who will judge us. All are given that description who can forgive sins. Again, we've mentioned all these before. Yeah, just to, to point out one of those real quick, uh, when you said it, it reminded me, I think Romans 8, 9 and 10, and excuse me while I get there real quick, is, I believe it says he, for the one who, I don't know, where is it? <clears throat> However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, so he's given, you know, the, the dwelling thing. Um, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is, al- is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to you through his spirit who dwells in you. Right. So, hmm. Yeah, I can see how that can be taken two different ways. But still, I think all of Romans 8 in general, if you take the entire thing, is more 
in line with the personhood of the Holy Spirit versus not. Yep. So the other one, the other article, you ready to move to those? Yeah. So this is on biblicaltruths.com. It's called 12 Reasons Why the Holy Spirit is Not a Person, Part 1. Um, we're only doing Part 1, I think. Um, right. And it's written by a guy named Edmund Macarig. You got so, me. That's, that's not right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and basically, it, it just speaks about tradition and common belief and, you know, does the whole illogical argument, well, the Trinity is not found in the Bible, so obviously it can't be true. Um, yeah, that's just a fallacious argument. Just because something isn't in there doesn't mean it's not a concept that we can can uh, create or describe. Or defend. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we, we did. We had three episodes last year on the, the nature of God, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his mm -hmm. omnipotence. All those words are Latin. None of them are in the Bible. <laughs> but right. we can defend the concept. So same kind of thing. The Trinity is not necessarily mentioned in the Bible, because, uh, but it is defensible, as I think we've proved pretty well. Right. So he gives these 12, 12 reasons, 12 facts on why the Holy Spirit can't be personal. And in each one, he basically just gives the title like the, because of this. And then he gives a couple of verses for it. And it, I, I'll be honest, there are probably more articulate arguments against the personhood of the Spirit out there. One of the reasons I picked this one was because, A, it did generally hit a lot of the topics I was finding. And, B, it's right there at the top of a Google search. And when you have... Your, your average church person going out and checking, you know, is the Holy Spirit, or the arguments for why the Holy Spirit isn't a person. This is going to be one of the first ones they find. And so I wanted to deal with it because it's prominent versus one that's, you know, 20 pages in. It might be well written, but nobody's going to find it. <laughs> you know? Right. So we'll tackle this one. Uh, so, yeah, we'll kick it off. First off, go ahead. Um, first of all, it says that it, it's this person again, this, this uh, author describes that God is, uh, the father is God and Christ is God, but the Holy spirit is not. It's just like a power of both of them. So, right. uh, the first thing it says is acts eight, acts one, eight, but you shall receive power when the Holy spirit has come upon you. Um, and when I see these things, I'm just like that. Yeah. <laughs> and I think about so, Matt, when Satan came upon um, Judas, do you think he got power? Probably. <laughs> Probably. When a demon and that's, the, that's the section. Right. Yeah, it's, it, 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 the Holy Spirit can't be person because he has power. Right. And yeah. Well, Billy, what about this? Take David, for instance. When he sends his armies out, it's... Uh, sending out essentially his power. I mean, he, he has a bunch of persons acting on his behalf. That's his military power right there. Right. Um, it doesn't make them non-personal. Right. It's just, a you know, it, he's using a personal agency to just demonstrate his power. Right. Kind of like Moses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you could, there's a hundred different ways you could say that. Yeah, but it, mm -hmm. it's just a, then it says Romans eight twenty six. I think you mentioned this before. Likewise, yep. the Spirit also helps in our weakness, makes intercession for us. Um, again, we already talked about this. An intercessor, uh, intercessor, a mediator, um, has a, a person, personal aspect to it. Um, and again, when you tie that to ancient context of how we mentioned Moses, and I mean, time after time, actually, God sent prophets to intercede for people i mean jonah was sent to intercede on uh on behalf of god to the ninevites i mean that's that's the entire point of that and christ is our intercessor yep uh it, <laughs> yeah if intercession is a negative yeah christ is out <laughs> mm -hmm. i just I, I don't get why they included that but um so that that is holy spirit is power therefore he can't be personal I don't see that carrying any water. Right. What about the Holy Spirit does not speak on his own authority? This is in particular John 16, 13. However, when the spirit of truth has come, it will guide you into all truth, for it will not speak on its own authority, 
initiative, will, uh, it won't speak for himself, but whatever it hears, it will speak. So Billy, is there anywhere else, any other person in the Bible that's described as not speaking from his own authority that you know of? Um, Jesus. Maybe Jesus is impersonal. <laughs> no, obviously. Yeah, John 15, 19. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. Or John eight twenty eight. Jesus therefore said, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and I do nothing of my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. So if, if the Holy Spirit not acting on his own initiative is a sign that he isn't personal, then Jesus isn't personal either. And I, uh, that's a problem. <laughs> You know, the way that they, they, you know, they, they transcribe, they change he for it. Right. But when it, the spirit of truth comes, it will guide you in, into all the truth for it will not speak on its own initiative, on its own initiative, but yeah. whatever it hears. So it's kind of like just a recording device, like an amplifier, you know, that's seemed to be what it's saying. This version, right. It's just like a. Mm -hmm. Like when you like your Wi-Fi signal, you get one of those extenders. It it just takes that signal and makes it go farther. That's it. It's a Wi-Fi booster. That's it. <laughs> that's what. That's the Holy. Sorry, Spirit. sorry, Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know where our heart is at, right? <laughs> um, and yeah, doesn't the Holy Spirit speaking and have authority prove evidence that He is a person? I think you added that note. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Makes sense to me. Right. Um. All right, here's here's a good one though. I mean, okay. obviously, right? Acts two thirty eight, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. True. On Christmas, I don't receive right. persons for right. Christmas. You, right. Obviously, I gifts. I give you cars and money and things like that. Did you say cars? C A R S or cards? Uh, cars. When yeah. when have you ever given me a car? <laughs> I'm looking for that in, in my mail. dreams. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm waiting for that car in the mail. I better. <laughs> right. Yeah, gift. Uh, so in this particular verse, Acts 2.38, gift is uh, doria. Simply means a gift. I mean, it's a free gift. It's something that's given. It's not, there's not a lot of nuance to it. Yeah, so a question. Billy, does this, this idea of the Holy Spirit being a gift definitely preclude the Holy Spirit from being a person? Or can, can a person be a gift? Um, Psalm 127, 3 says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. Mm. So children aren't persons. Got it. Well, no. Well, yeah. This They're is animal. in New York, Billy. <laughs> this is, children's are persons. So are babies. So are unborn babies. They're all persons. Right. <laughs> yeah. Does it... Isn't I, I, I couldn't find it in a short time, but isn't um, the church considered a gift as well? Mm. like a gift to the bridegroom or the, vice versa? I don't know. Uh, have to, if you can, I, I don't know. Could be. I don't know that, that reference though. Oh, you're no good. I know. While you're looking that up, First Timothy 4.14, do not neglect, <laughs> do not neglect the gift that is in you. Um, which is given to you by a prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. So, hey, you, Timothy, you young preacher out there, don't neglect the, what they're saying is, don't neglect the Holy Spirit that's in you, which was given to you by the laying on of hands by elders. The gift here is charisma. It's not right. pneumo anything. It's not the Spirit. Uh, we have to read that this is the Holy Spirit into this verse. In fact, the fact that it's charisma, uh, which is a gift of grace, undeserved favor, associated with spiritual gifts, but also like just uh, grace endowments, anything that's meant to edify the church. Uh, I don't see any reason why we need to assume that 1 Timothy 4.14 is even talking about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about the gifts that the Holy Spirit imparts in people. Think Romans 12 and the fact that the Spirit gives to each a portion of faith to right. do with and he's saying, don't neglect that gift. As in, Billy and I, if we go too long, well, I, I, this is true for me. I'm sure it's true for you. But if you go too long without doing one of the studies that we do, I, I, like, I feel it. Like it, it starts to, to bother me. 
but as soon as I, I, I exercise it, like I feel more complete, you know, <laughs> it's just, it's something that's in us and we don't want to neglect that gift. And that's true for any Christian. You've been given a gift. Don't neglect it. There's no reason to believe this is the Holy Spirit. But even if it was, again, if children can be gifts, the Holy Spirit can be a gift and they could still be a person. Correct. So that one doesn't hold water. Um, you, I mean, I'm trying to think, I guess going by their definition, you could, you can read it that way too. Do not gl- neglect the power that is in you. And obviously God is the one that gave you the power. Um, but the, and the power was given to you by prophecy in the laying of hands. Um, so I, I mean, you could see how they could take it as well. Yeah. But that's still even if, yeah, but you have to assume that the Holy spirit is not personal in order right. to get that right. It, right. This doesn't prove that. Right. Um, the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit needs to be stirred up. Stirred up. up. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. This is right in the, kind of the same context of Timothy, where basically, you know, this was referring to the gift as the Holy Spirit instead of the actual gift, i.e. teaching, prophecy, tongues, wisdom, as being the gift. It's, well, I don't I don't even think this is talking about the Holy Spirit. It's the same word, charisma. Right. I don't see why it can't mean, therefore, I remind you to stir up, as in but our teaching. If we use it, the more we use it, the more we, we exercise it and study and prepare, I, I consider that stirring up our gift, right? Right. <laughs> You're fanning the flames of it. So, right. uh, but, uh, what I'm saying is that in, in taking their, you know, they're saying that the gift is the Holy Spirit um, instead of the gift being some other thing. Like, yeah, right. And it, it, and like you said, um, hey, I, I, Matt, I want you to on Sunday after your after your pastor teaches, I want you to go up there and I want you to stir up your pastor by telling him that Calvinism is bogus. <laughs> so just because you I'm telling you to stir up something doesn't mean that you're not a person or what? Uh, or that my pastor isn't a person. Yeah. Right. Billy, you ever had to, uh, you ever gone into a room and all your kids were sitting around like doing absolutely nothing and you stirred them up <laughs> and got them to do something. Right. Yeah. You can stir up people for show. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about this? Uh, the Holy spirit can be quenched. Quenched like uh, a fire. You can put it out, put it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, do not quench or stifle the spirit. First Thessalonians five nineteen. Um, it does mean quench, and that, that Greek word there means to put out like a fire, to suppress, not in a, not suppress in the way that Romans one eighteen uses it. That's a different word. Um, but this is to, to put out, essentially. Um, I don't know. Can you, can you quench a person? Like, put when out. I pulled out the gun, I quenched the speaker. <laughs> right? You have some lunatic speaking on the corner. Right. And he's talking about, let's say he, he's talking about how bad police are. Right. And the police show up and guess what? When they showed up, they quenched him. He no longer was speaking any longer. Right? I've never, I've never heard that word used like that, but I, I see what you're saying. Uh, what, what but that, I mean, it means to stifle, right. You know, yeah. we would, yeah. we would use it, use it in that kind of language, but that's, that's what it means. It's you're quenching something, you're suppressing it. You're right. If I were to hit mute on you right now, or just turn the volume down. And I have I have successfully quenched you speaking to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've, I've suppressed it. Uh, and, and Paul makes a similar point, Ephesians four thirty, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom you were sealed on the day of redemption. Uh, the point in both of these is don't treat the the Holy Spirit with disdain or suppression. Don't ignore him. Uh, Romans eight. Don't don't seek the flesh, but instead keep your mind on the things of the Spirit, so that you can please God. Uh, I think quench right. here ties into that overall theme of choose the spirit, follow the spirit, listen to the spirit. Don't choose the flesh. So, right. Yeah. Quenching would be like hardening and suppressing. And again, like you mentioned with Ephesians, do not grieve. So now you've added, you know, an emotion to the Holy spirit. Do not grieve the Holy spirit. Yeah. Well, and and if you're grieving and suppressing the Holy spirit, then, then that Holy spirit seems to me to have some kind of mission or objective that you are ignoring. Mm-hmm. And 
uh, that seems to imply personal agency, but I could see them saying, well, yeah, the, the objective is that God has a purpose for the power that he's implementing. And, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's interesting. What's the next one? Uh, it can be poured out and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Fun fact, Billy. Paul wasn't a person either. Did you know that? Really? Yeah, no. Philippians 2.17. But even if I, Paul, am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of our faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. Really, Paul is a drink. Like, like <laughs> wine? Maybe? We just use his name like a metaphor. He's not actually a person. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you can pour out people. It's a... Uh, it's an idiom. <laughs> yeah, it's just strange. I, I mean, I, I, it feels like fishing to me. Yes. You know? Yeah, it's trying to find a, have a concept in your mind and trying to find any way. And, and I've, I've been in this situation before back when I, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't, I better not say I don't want to cause turmoil to some of our listeners. <laughs> Back when I believed a certain pro uh, type of prophecy, I used to do that. Oh, oh, <laughs> yeah. He's definitely not talking about pre pre trip. Or... <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe we you know, we should have a a longer episode on eschatology. Maybe sometime this summer, just for funsies, <laughs> just to get people riled up a little bit. In if love, you have, if you have anything really to prophecy, you're going to have a billion listeners. Yeah. And if you can tie it to modern day uh, uh, cults and satanic worship. Oh, and, yeah. oh man. All the, what, how many days after the Super Bowl was it when I sent you that link that had like 400,000 views on YouTube? Yeah. It was Three like 48 four? hours. Yeah. It was insane. I see. It makes me want to do clickbait stuff like that, but I know that's like I would feel convicted if we did. Right. <laughs> um, so uh, another one here, the Holy Spirit is a cleansing agent. So like dishwash, dishwashing soap or, you know, right. You right, know, right. Laund 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 laundry detergent. Awesome. Not by works. Yeah. yeah. Not by <laughs> works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Well, so let's, let's go to something real quick. The washing of regeneration is not, something that's done by the Holy Spirit. Like they're misunderstanding that. Right. The washing of regeneration is the bringing near of someone through the reconciling or reconciliation of a relationship. Mm -hmm. They were once dead. Now they're alive again. They are regenerated. It's, it's a credit. Yeah. It's metaphoric language. Right. And it has to do with being baptized into Christ. Right. Now that you are seen as my son, you are in a right relationship with me. You're regenerate. Right. You're alive again. Right. You've been placed into Christ and his blood has now washed you. Or even, it also says, you know, be, we've been washed by the water of the word. Mm -hmm. Christ is obviously the word. What about renewal? Like, can can you renew a person? Can a person renew renewing a person? of the Holy... So that of really is from, I'm pretty sure, um, when you look at it. Ek. Yeah, I think so. I actually had that pulled up at one time. Titus 3.5, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. Um, come on. But I don't, I don't understand how, I mean, can, can, can you, Matt, can you, even if we are, if we took their interpretation about like the Holy Spirit is the one washing us, can, can you wash anything? I mean, uh, I, I'm not going to say do you. If you ask my anything? wife, she would say <laughs> no. <laughs> but yes, no, I, like, let's say you were, let's say we live closer to each other, that you're my neighbor, and you're down in the dumps and uh, about whatever you're depressed, maybe you lost your job. I could come over and help renew your, your outlook. I can help renew just your, your whole perception on your situation so that you are better able to cope and handle it. Like renewal right. is something we can do for one another. I think, I mean, what's his name? The, um, actor, he died. Band, band down by the river. Enough. Band down by the river. 
Can you live in a van? I have no idea. Down by the river. Oh, I know you know who this is. Um, he was on Saturday Night Live. Oh, the anyway, guy. Yeah, he was Farm, chubby. Mc, yeah, uh, no, anyway, no, he he used to do a skit where he was a motivational speaker, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you bring in someone and, and they're renewing your motivation, mm-hmm. right? They're they're motivational speakers, so re, they're renewing your spirit in order to get you to do something. So yeah. it, it actually points to being personal. And really, any teacher can be said to be to help uh, someone. Like, let's say you go back to school for continued education. The a teacher is going to, or professor, or whatever, is going to be renewing your mind. Uh, and, and that's the point of Romans 12, 1 right. and 2. It'd be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Who is doing the renewing and who's guiding you in all of this? Mm-hmm. The Holy Spirit. He's, he's the personal agent that's walking you through this. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the Holy Spirit is uh, our seal of redemption, as in Ephesians 4.30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, uh, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. <clears throat> So that's if the Holy Spirit is a seal, then he can't be a masking person. tape, right? That's what that means. Masking tape. But you probably duct tape would stick better. <laughs> well, that's yeah, obviously. Um, first of all, I, I, <laughs> I see this as like being marked by the Holy Spirit, right? Um, do you not agree with the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed? See, it points the, the whom, like it's the Holy Spirit that did the marking. Not that the Holy Spirit. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Isn't that how you read this? Ephesians 4.30? Yeah, I'm actually looking up that ha. So, um, to Theu in ha. Uh, it's it's uh, of God in whom you were sealed. But in, in, I don't know if you can translate that, in which you were sealed. Uh, it'd be interesting to know. Parallel in, see. by, with, yeah. Yeah, in whom, in whom, in whom, in all of these translators give him personal agency, in whom, whereby mm-hmm. ye are sealed until the day of redemption. So King James does not. Uh, the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. Uh, you were sealed by him for a day of redemption. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I go back to the first half of the verse. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Right. How do you grieve a non-personal being? Like, that's if that's just the if that's just the power of God, then you'd be grieving God, not his, not not the power. But the fact that you're grieving the Holy Spirit of God, to me, implies personal agency. Right. So mm, I, don't, I don't think that one's very helpful on their side either. <clears throat> <laughs> you you keep looking ahead and laughing, don't you? I do. I do. Uh, sorry. <laughs> All right. Obviously, this this is the winner. The Holy Spirit comes from both the Father and the Son, right? So it's an impersonal power. Yeah. That's, you know, I mean, John 15, 26, right? When the Helper comes, whom I, Christ, shall send to you from the Father. So Christ and the Father are sending. The Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. He will testify. Wait a minute. They mess. Jesus messed that up. Um, he will testify of me. Or Romans eight nine. We've already talked about Romans eight, so we'll we'll we won't go through that one again. Um, yeah. So can can uh, two people send another person? Um, I, I don't know. I don't think that's possible. Two people I, send another person. I mean, like I know one person can send a person, but can two people send a person? I, I suppose if you want to it's, like stretch the truth a little bit, if you, if you really want to get out there. Yeah. I bet, I bet even three people, I bet a group of elders can lay hands on a single person and then send that person off and then write him letters later. I'm saying that could possibly happen, but you know, I'm, I'm a little crazy. Right. Or, <laughs> this, or, or two parents like send off their son ooh, to college. So you're saying that the father and the son are the parents of the spirit. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is a simile like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a co-regency situation, right? The father 
it has given all authority to the son, but they're both there. They're both going to judge. They're both like he, the son is doing everything on behalf of the father. And they, co-regents, the two rulers, are sending forth uh, a helper. And, and, and this helper is a gift to the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and he is going to guide them in all this truth and everything. Uh, it, it's, there's no problem seeing this as, a, as him being personal. Just because he comes from the father and the son doesn't mean he's not personal. And, and this is so strange because uh, they're trying to say like he comes from both the father and the son. Like, I don't know. I don't know what they're trying to say, but it's, it's just like God, the father's reigning through his agent, the son. Right. And that's what Christ is saying is that I'm going to send you the Holy spirit, but my father's the one that's sending it. I'm telling the father to send the Holy spirit now. Right. That any kind of agency, just like when the father, sent the son to earth, right? In John eight forty two, if God were your father, you would love me for I proceeded forth and have come from God, right? So he sent me. So the father sent the son and the son sent the spirit. I mean, I don't see how this is pointing to one of them not being a person. Yeah. And uh, what I find interesting is that it says uh, he will testify of me. He, not it. That one often intensified by an article preceding that that one there, um, these those things. So it doesn't that the word the Greek word for he doesn't necessarily have to be personal. It doesn't have to be a a, a pronoun for a person, right? Um, but generally, a demonstrative pronoun that man woman thing properly of persons things times places somewhat remote from the speaker. Okay, so. Uh, that that word that just because it's translated, he will testify of me, doesn't necessarily mean that it's personal. Um, it doesn't prove one way or the other. Just right. want to throw that out there. <clears throat> so th- this one is actually interesting, and this person um, could have actually listed probably like twenty different passages about greetings and such yeah, relating to this. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not just two; they only reference two. There's like twenty. I found it uh, on, on another page. Um, but the Holy Spirit is not included in any of Paul's greetings. So when Paul would write a letter, he would say, To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Not mentioning any of the Spirit. And this is like in 20 different places. And as soon as I started reading it, I'm like, well, duh, I understand why. And that's because the Holy Spirit is now here. As we just read in the previous verse, in the previous section, you know, Christ left, and he, when he left, he sent the Holy Spirit. So now you have the Father and the Spirit in heaven, right? And who is with us always? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, right? So mm-hmm. why would the Holy Spirit be greeting us when the Holy Spirit is already with us and teaching us all things? And I think to your point, we talked about it uh, in the beginning when we were looking at Dr. Luganville's stuff, Second Corinthians so was it 13, 14. Mm-hmm. He does mention it in the outro, and after talking to the, the Corinthians about all the ways they need to fix their stuff and answer their questions and everything else, he said, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Right. So he includes, I mean, yes, greetings from God and from Jesus who aren't with you, but by the end, he's saying, um, but, you know, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, he is including that uh, because, as you said, the Holy Spirit is in their midst. Right. So, it's an interesting point. I don't know that it's it's – it's definitely not a, a slam dunk case in their favor. Right. Um, and, and this falls under a general, uh, it's it, the saying the evidence, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because we don't have the Holy Spirit mentioned in Romans one or first Corinthians one doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is a, a personal agent. It, God, Paul could have had whatever reason, any number of reasons for not including him, Correct. but it doesn't prove your side of the thing. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> And then I think this is the last one. Uh, oh, no, there's, there's, oh, one. there's a couple more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> the Holy Spirit is never seen together with the Father and Son in visions. And I think they mean visions in heaven. Yes, I think that's what uh, it's right. talking about heavenly visions. Right. Because, I mean, if we want to look at visions in general, whether or not it was a vision, but you have, you know, God the Father speaking and the Spirit as a dove and then the Son. I mean, there's all three. Question. Jesus said, nobody has seen the Father except the one who's come from the Father. Only he has seen the Father. In these visions, are people actually seeing the Father? Um, They're seeing a vision of the Father. (laughs) 
They're not seeing the but, father, but not not him completely. So I mean, and does does is the father physical or spirit? Spirit, right? So if nobody's actually seen the father, maybe just a phys- like a representation of him uh, in a vision, then and he is spirit. Then should we expect for people to be seeing the Holy Spirit? Um, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, no, but you do. We do see actually this in um, Revelation. Hmm. In Revelation Where? one four three one four five and five six, it talks about the seven spirits who are before his throne, and most commentators reference this as being uh, speaking of the Holy Spirit. But aren't they aren't they represented by lampstands? No, seven Am lampstands are of... different. Oh, I'm thinking it's of seven lampstands and the seven spirits. It's different. Interesting. Okay, so. Yeah. Perhaps there are places where the Holy Spirit is seen. Although, again, you have him being represented by m- seven spirits, multiple things. Right. This isn't necessarily him in all his glory, right. but just a-, a way of seeing him. Right. And they, most people say that those seven reference back to, I think it's in Isaiah, right? Or there's seven spirits, and it talks about love and all that stuff. But yeah. Well, but that's if you, you're goofy pre-mill. If post-mill is true, then... That no, no, that's literal. So it doesn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna keep poking that bear. We're gonna eventually just get people riled up. We'll do eschatology for fun. Uh, <laughs> the Holy Spirit. Oh, this is my favorite. This is. Oh man. Okay. The, the Holy. <laughs> we laugh. It's gonna be laugh. The Holy Spirit is responsible for conceiving Jesus and Mary, uh, which will make the Holy Spirit Jesus's father, not the Father, God the Father. So. Um, Matthew 1, 20, read it in the ESV. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from, or by, or begotten of, from, or begotten of the Holy Spirit. So Billy, because if the Holy Spirit were a person, and he was the one who conceived the Son, then that would make him the father of the Son. That's the argument here. Mm-hmm. Instead of the Father, God the Father. Right. So, so yeah. Boom. Slam dunk. <laughs> it's just a completely slam dunk. Uh, it, to me, this is just, um, it starts getting a little weird. Because <laughs> you start like <laughs> thinking about, I don't know, is there like a physical body going on here? What's, what's up here? Um, but it's the idea is that when, when Jesus said all authority have been, has give, been given to me, does that mean that God, the father no longer exists and that he's still not God? You know, it, it's, it's just weird. This, this way that they did this, like, well, because the Holy spirit is the agent in which the father exercised and begot the son that makes it not the father's son. But we're dealing with one one being here, right? Well, and Represent- keep in mind, the son preceded Jesus. Right. Just just because Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit does not mean that the son was not the son prior to that. You read John 1. In the beginning was the word, right. the word was with God. Yeah. And so... Right. Like the son didn't become a son, you know, at the birth of... At the incarnation. Jesus. No. Right. So right. I think it falls flat based on, simply on that. Um, yeah. Now, the fact that it's the Father and the Son, I think, has more to do with the fact that the, the roles that the person's play, right. and one submitting to the other. Not that they're he's not that the Father's higher in power, right? But that yeah. So no, I just this is the the incarnation has nothing to do with the role of Father and Son because that preceded the incarnation, you know, not infinitely. Don't don't freak out on me, <laughs> but uh, uh, it preceded the creation of the world. Correct. Okay, so that those are the, the <laughs> those are the twelve reasons that we found on that. And if you like, I don't know anything before I say all that. Anything else you want to add on this study or this particular topic? Well, that? I mean, are you more convinced, less convinced? I am. I am. <laughs> <laughs> I am not swayed in the least uh, from my opinion that the Holy Spirit is a personal. Uh, third person of the Trinity. I, I am 
completely could, comfortable now. Could that be just because you're blinded by your tradition? Yes. It could be that I am completely blinded. It's true that I have never changed any position from from the tradition that I grew up in. I've I've completely stayed. No. <laughs> if if there's if you're ever gonna listen to a podcast where two guys are interested in dropping tradition to do something else because it makes more sense, it's this one. Uh, but <laughs> so, <laughs> Oh, that's tradition? Then we don't believe it. <laughs> nah, I don't like it. Let's get something else in here. Uh, but no, I think tradition is correct in this situation. I think that the Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity. I think the Trinity is correct. And these arguments, while interesting, and again, there could be more articulate ways of putting these, but I, I just I just don't, don't buy it. Not good enough. You? Yeah. I'm sure there's probably a, a more scholarly work out there and, and maybe somebody who's read a book like that can send it to us, but yeah. Yep. I, and, I, I'm not convinced either. And I will say, while we love Dr. Luganbill, that was the intro to like a bajillion page study that he has in the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee there are more scholarly defenses of the personhood of the Trinity as well. So it's not, I mean, of the Holy Spirit. So it's not like we're, we're giving the best possible argument from both sides. However, just based on the popularity of this particular article, I wanted to use it to, to, to take a look at what are their arguments and you know, what kind of standards are they putting on these arguments? And they're, they're not good. I just hate to break it to you. They're, they're not good arguments at all. Those verses that they're using, just don't say what this person is arguing that they say. Mm-hmm. So. Um, one passage that I didn't even bring up that kind of relates to this uh, we, that we can end with just because it's cool is um, like cool. the sword of the spirit, right? Right. So whose whose sword is it? The uh, spirit. Right. Doesn't that also imply some personhood here? Like the sword of the spirit is the word of God. So. Well, uh, so like uh, a, a non-personal being doesn't have possessions, is that what you're saying? Right. Mm. The sword of the spirit, right? Does the table I mean, have when, legs? When, when, when you think about... <laughs> when you think about <laughs> well, when you think about the, the, the metaphor of, of a sword, right? It, it uh -huh. seems to... Uh, and somebody wielding a sword, it seems to imply wielding. a person, right? True. Just yeah. like there was a sword proceeding from the mouth of you know the one in revelation right obviously that was referencing the word of god um i, <laughs> I was this last week i was talking um about figures of speech and scripture and stuff like that relating to uh god is love right and all that was the foundation of the whole love love and hate in scripture and the idiom uh, but yeah. you know, and and they were coming up with all the various um, figures of speech in scripture <laughs> and i brought that one i see so what do you think about the sword coming out of the mouth of the one in revelation real or not real <laughs> and it, it's already getting funny because every time we'd say something like that's not real there's somebody that was going like what <laughs> <laughs> feet of burnished bronze and right. yeah there's that's not real that. what <laughs> hey watch yeah one day you're gonna have a dream where you see all that and you're gonna be like Oh, <laughs> it is real. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think there's plenty of, and we haven't, th this episode wasn't necessarily to give our best defense of why the Trinity is personal. I mean, excuse me, I keep saying that the Holy Spirit is personal. Um, we wanted to take a look at, and just it really, we're trying out this, this format for these episodes. Do you like that we pull up a couple articles, pro and con, on a particular subject and we just go through it and give our opinions on it. And because we're interested in doing more of them, but we need your help listeners on topics. And in particular, the, the articles that you want us to review. So send them our way. We want to, we want to review more. We like this kind of thing. And this, this gives us a chance to, to, I think, I don't know, it, it connect us more with the, the listeners one but also grapple with some of the more popular stuff out there. Maybe we haven't come across, but you have in your own circles that we can shed some light on here and get out to the community who, who we, if you're not a part of the Facebook group, go there because there's a lot of people who are well equipped to, to talk through these things and uh, rightly divide the word that may not be familiar with some of the issues that you could bring up that we could talk about. So yeah, right. what else we got? 
Yeah, so if you have a, an article that is like this, you know, where it gives a, a doctrine or a point or a belief system or a principle or whatever, and it, you know, lists its references and such and provides reasons and all that, send it to us and we'll do the same thing. Um, it's again, it's we, we don't have, we're not, we didn't both come into this thinking, oh, you know, we're just going to deny this. We're going to, if it, if there's positives and negatives or whatever, we're going to look at both sides. Yep. Again, we're not, we're not just stuck in the tradition pole or, oh, I believe this. So I'm going to stick to this. Yeah. It, it, if something makes more sense scripturally, logically than a traditional belief, then we're willing to change because ultimately we're accountable to God. We have to make up for our own minds, uh, make up for ourselves, uh, understand for ourselves what we believe and not just depend on others to tell us what we believe. So uh, be convinced in our own minds, I should say. That's Romans 14 towards the end. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, Bible bro down at gmail.com. If you want to email us, you uh, can also go to the Facebook group, do that. You can message us from the Facebook group. Message Billy and I both because, you know, we have funky schedules and if one of us can't answer, the other one can't. Uh, I don't know. What else? That it? I think that's it. I think we, again, um, I think we have about a week before the debate. What's oh, the 22nd? Yeah. 22nd. Friday. Yep. So um, that should be, should be good. Pray for Braxton over at yeah. Trinity Radio. That he will not sound like an income poop. <laughs> no way. That's not going to happen. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, just wanted to say, wanna... I just wanted to say an income poop on on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to listen to the debate live, uh, I'm sure Billy, uh, I'll try to remember, but uh, one of us will throw the, the link into the group. So join the Facebook group and listen along. I don't know if you can have like a live viewing party, but yeah, I'm probably gonna have a watch party of some kind. You could just be commenting live on the Facebook post, the group post, mm -hmm. something like that. I don't know. Cool. All right. Uh, Coming up Thursday, we'll have a, pot, a mini cast on a thing about a stuff, some stuff. <laughs> I think that's it. God bless. God bless. <laughs>